introduce our speaker for today on season extension is uh, Neith Little. She's the urban educator for University of Maryland Extension and happy to have her talking about this topic today. So Neith. For a couple seconds and then I'll stop it uh, to save all your bandwidth. So this is me. Welcome to my messy office. Um, I'm the the Urban Ag Educator for Extension. I'm located in Baltimore City and I'm excited to be talking with you today about Season Extension. Would you like me to get started with the, the presentation, Shannon, or do you have anything else? Oh, it looks like we're getting started. All right. On my end, it looks like it's popped up already. should be down in the right hand corner of your screen. I find it, it, it helpful to know a little bit about the audience when, before I try to start talking so I don't make it too basic or too advanced. Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that open if anyone wants to uh, add any more. Oh, awesome. So some folks with a very short growing season who want some ideas on how to deal with that. Um, someone who's in public education and wants to share information probably with the folks that they teach. Uh, someone who has had experience with fall season extension, but the cover didn't stay attached. That's a, that's a common, common problem. Thank you very much. I'll leave that up in case anyone wants to add anything while I'll get going with the presentation. So my goal for the hour that we've got today is I'd like to have you come out of this with the ability to consider what type of season extension would be appropriate for your farm and your goals. And uh, I'd like to share with you some of the key pitfalls and some tips for success as you start trying out season extension technology. And I'd also like to make sure that I share with you where to go to learn more because there's a lot of information and it's hard to cram it all into to one hour. Um, so in the, in the uh, pod earlier with the slides, there was also a PDF of information about where you can learn more on season extension with some really great links. And I'll have those at the end of this, this presentation as well. So let's start off with, uh, with why, why even bother with season extension. And I put this in the risk management framework that the Women in Agriculture program uses. Um, people, people use season extension to, to manage production risk primarily. They, you can use season extension tools to try and mitigate climate variability as, as climate changes and becomes more variable. Some of the farmers I've talked with have used, have moved towards using high tunnels to protect their tomatoes from torrential downpours that can cause disease problems and flatten them. Um, season, ex season extension tools can be a good way to shelter from pests and diseases. They can help you reduce weed pressure. But if you don't manage them properly, you can actually increase your production risk. You can cook your crops. Um, you can increase humidity, which can lead to disease pressure. So you, you can use these tools to reduce your production risk, but you need to learn, um, learn what you're doing so that you don't you don't cause yourself more problems than you're solving. And that's one of the things I'd like to cover today. Uh, season extension tools also can be used to manage uh, marketing risks. You can use them to extend that very short growing season into the, what we call the shoulders of the season and then market your crops at a time when there's less competition. And you can also then sometimes produce niche crops that you wouldn't be able to produce outside of, say, a high tunnel uh, like ginger or turmeric or um, some specialty herbs. But you should also, on um, the downside, consider your financial risk management. 
Um, building a high tunnel uh, using plastic culture requires investment and maintenance, and it's important to think about before you invest into those tools whether these costs uh, will will be paid for by the benefits of the crops that you're producing uh, by extending your growing season by being able to produce niche crops you wouldn't be able to produce otherwise. So there are four main types of season extension that we're going to talk about. Um, crop mulches, row covers, high tunnels, and greenhouses. And I like this, this picture because it, it shows kind of all three of them with the crop mulches at the lower left-hand corner and then the low tunnels or row covers and then some high tunnels. Um, it doesn't actually show greenhouses, and we're not really going to talk about greenhouses today, um, except for how we tend to define a high tunnel versus a greenhouse. And there are other, other trainings you can go to if you want to learn more about greenhouses, but they tend to be more, um, more investment intensive and more energy intensive, so we don't tend to categorize them the same as, as these low energy, low investment season extension tools. So let's start off with crop mulching systems. And if, as we're going along, you have any questions, definitely pop them into the chat pod and I can try and answer them as we go. And we can also talk a little bit at the end of the presentation. So crop mulching systems are kind of the, maybe you wouldn't think of them as a season extension tool, um, but you actually are modifying that micro environment around your crops. You're, you're, reducing weed pressure, you're increasing soil temperature. Um, in some cases, if you're using reflective mulches, you might be decreasing soil temperature, and you're protecting the moisture and you're protecting your crop from pests and diseases. Historically, we've used organic mulches, um, like straw. Probably if you've grown tomatoes, you've tried using straw as a mulch. Uh, there was some interest in paper mulches, but those have quickly been eclipsed by these new plastic mulch products. Organic mulches, people still use them often. Um, they, uh, the, the, the con of an organic mulch is that they tend to be bulky and they weigh a lot and they require a lot of labor to get them spread. If you've ever, if you've ever spread straw on a tomato crop, you know that takes a lot of labor. But you don't need as much in equipment investment necessarily, and it does decompose. You don't have as much of the disposal problem as you do with the plastic mulches. You can use, still use organic mulches for weed suppression and moisture retention and that crucial reducing soil splash. That's the, that's the way you can use mulches to reduce disease pressure with things like tomatoes um, that if the soil splashes up, that's a way to introduce when it rains there's a splash from the raindrops, and that can introduce bacteria to the leaves of your tomatoes. Uh, and that so covering the soil is one way to use integrated pest management to protect your, your crops from diseases and reduce that uh, disease introduction. Plastic mulches, as opposed to organic mulches, are a little bit easier to scale up to larger scale um, because they have less labor required to install them, you can get equipment to install plastic mulches, which allows you to use them at a large scale. But if you do decide you want to use plastic mulches um, and get a, a mulch layer, that is an equipment investment. So you kind of have to weigh those two things. If you're at a small scale, maybe it's not worth it. Um, if, you, if you use a uh, drip tape underneath, it can enable you to use fertigation, which can increase your, your efficiency of fertilizer use. And the plastic mulches, again, help with weed control, weed suppression, and moisture retention. The plastic mulches, as opposed to organic mulches, tend to be used more for increasing soil, soil temperature, um, helping the soil warm up in the spring so you can get an earlier crop in, keeping the soil warmer in the fall so you can extend, it, extend your crop further into the season. So that's why I have classed, we've included these in season extension tools. couple of definitions. Plastic culture is a term we use for using plastic products in general, in particular plastic films, to enhance plant production. And a plastic culture system is combining several, several of these tools, mulch, drip tape, uh, maybe even a low tunnel on top, uh, to, to improve your production system. You can just use a basic just basically the, the mulch and the trickle tape. 
some folks can then even uh, add more features, an injector for fertigation, raised beds to improve your, your microclimate management, uh, row covers and low tunnels on top. Um, but you could just be as simple as just using mulch. It depends on, on what, uh, what level of intensification is appropriate for your farm. Oops, I skipped too many slides. There we go. We've got a couple photos here. Let me know if they're not loading for you. I know sometimes the photos take a little while to load depending on your, your web connection. So here's some of the equipment that people use for laying plastic mulch. On the left, we've got a plastic mulch layer. It's got those coulters that then fill in the, the soil on the side. Um, on the right, we've got a bed former that forms the bed before you lay the plastic mulch. If you've noticed those uh, those footprints, this is actually from a field day demonstration. You wouldn't you wouldn't actually want to walk on your beds like that if it were if it were real. Um, and the the coulters there laying soil over the edges that's really key because if you're using plastic mulches, it's really important to bury the edges well. So if you don't use the equipment to do it for you, that's an important step to factor into your your labor timing because um, you'll need to. Uh, you'll need to add soil on the edges to keep the mulch down by hand. Here's another close-up of that plastic mulch layer, and it's a relatively low-tech piece of equipment, and just attaches onto the end of your, your tractor. You don't even need a PTO attachment for this. A water wheel transplanter, that's one, one step up for mechanization. Um, you can just, most of the plastic mulches, if you notice the little holes there, you can punch a hole just with your fingers. Um, but if you are at a larger scale, you can scale up with um, something that will punch a hole for you, and you can have folks ride along and plop your transplants in. It tends to be a little bit less rough on your back than going along and straddling the row and putting transplants in that way. So it does tend to speed things up and be a little bit less rough on your your, uh, your field crew. There are a couple water wheel transplanters that will put the put the transplants in for you um, automatically. I've, I've used a couple of them. They do tend to occasionally put one, one out of every four or five in upside down. <laughs> so if that's um, a level of error that you're comfortable with, that might be all right. If you're, if you're a very high value crop where precision is important, that might not be as appropriate for you. You kind of have to give it a try first. The stake pounder is a piece of tool equipment that I'm very jealous of. I've spent a lot of time pounding tomato steaks with one of those hand pounders. Uh, so mechanizing that does seem very appealing if you're doing a very large scale tomato production. And uh, the reason why we, we stake tomatoes if you haven't produced them before is to keep them up off the ground again to reduce disease pressure, keep the soil particles off, and to enable air to move in between your plants. And that can help reduce the moisture and the humidity on the leaves, which again, anytime you can you can keep tomatoes dry, that's really important for reducing disease pressure. Another piece of equipment you can use with a, a mulch system, it, it can enable you to, you, if you're using an herbicide, only spray it then in the rows. Um, and you can sh get something like this that will shield your uh, shield your rows and then spray the spray the walkways in between. So that can be an IPM tool for using an herbicide only in the places where you need it instead of everywhere. The challenge with mulches, uh, with the plastic mulches, is that then you need to get them off the field at the end of the season. Um, you can do that by hand. There are tools available like this mulch uh, lifter, which will roll them up on a spool. Some tips for installing plastic culture. It's ideal to apply it to warm soil um, a little while ahead of before you're planting. And loose, moist soil is best. It's just like when you're tilling or planting. Otherwise, um, you don't want it to be too wet because then you'll compact things. You don't want it to be too moist because then you'll have transplant um, problems with damping off and it'll clump too much. Uh, it's really, really important to lay your mulch you, uh, you to lay your plastic tightly because any air bubbles that you've got will then tend to increase the, 
the tendency for the mulch to be lifted up by wind and pulled away. So if that's one of the, um, I know one of the participants had trouble with cover staying attached. That might have been a row cover though. Um, raised beds can help with improving the benefit that you get out of your mulch, but they're not entirely necessary. The key though is really to bury the edges well. And some of the farmers I work with in urban settings are using landscape cloth in very, very small scale areas. Um, the challenge with that is it's more expensive to buy, and but, um, but you can reuse it for a couple of years, and it does seem to work for them in very, very small scale, like one high tunnel, two high tunnels. And they claim that once you've got it in a high tunnel, you don't need to bury the edges as well because it's heavier and um, there's less wind there. So there's some things you can try if, you, if you're on small scale like that. A uh, key tip is to apply the fertilizer before you lay the plastic. Um, even though you punch the holes with the transplants, it, uh, it doesn't help very much to apply fertilizer on top of the plastic. It won't get into where your plant's roots can get at it. Um, and usually folks in, uh, install that trickle tube at the same time the plastic is laid if you're using trickle tube irrigation. And if you do that, you do, then do have the option of trying fertigation, where you would inject water-soluble fertilizer into your irrigation and spread it along the tube. And that's another way of using your fertilizer more efficiently and reducing weed pressure, because you're getting the water and the fertilizer right to your crop where they need it, and there's less opportunity for competition from weeds. Big challenge with Plastic culture mulch is disposal. Um, you can take it to the landfill. Some of it is recyclable, but you get the problem of all the soil stuck to the plastic, so some recyclers won't take it. Some people are using it for fuel. The one thing I would not recommend is what's shown in this picture, dumping it um, on your land, your own land <laughs> by the edge of the woods. Um, that's kind of a no-no. <laughs> ah, we've got a question. I have raised beds. And one problem I wanted was to use raised beds with covers, used a pipe bender, uh, ended up with six beds to cover, didn't know how to attach it at the bottom. Ah, having wind problems sounds like you're using um, low covers, with essentially low tunnels with little pipes and uh, that remake cloth on top. Yeah. Um, were you having trouble attaching the pipes or the, the row cover at the bottom. Um, I'll keep yeah, one of the one of the I'll keep going, we'll talk about that a little bit more. One of the key things with row covers is to just like with the plastic mulch, bury the edges with your soil. So if you've got the raised beds, then you would shovel soil from the um, from the inter rows, from the paths in between your beds onto the edge of your cover. Um, you can use those uh, like big staples that people use. Eight foot pipes covered with a winter cloth. Okay. Cool. You can use those big um, landscaper staples, but uh, oh, that you can use that more with the, the landscape cloth, though. If you try to use that on plastic mulch, it'll just tear your plastic mulch. Um, and if you want to use that on your, your row covers, it depends on the, the strength of the row cover you're using. If it's that um, sort of poly, uh, poly cloth that's kind of an opaque uh, white color, um, some of the heavier ones can handle the, the landscape staples, but some of the lighter ones probably would just tear. So it can be a real challenge trying to keep them from blowing away, for sure. The, the only thing I can really suggest the best way is to try and bury the edges at least to six inches in soil, um, but then you run into the challenge of if you need to get in there and change things, you have to dig it back up again. Um, the another challenge with plastic mulches: some folks are marketing photo uh, biodegradable plastic mulches, which is um, something in the future that we're hoping you won't be able to pull, you won't necessarily need to pull them up at the end of the season. Um, but unfortunately, biodegradable usually means photodegradable, so the light from the sun will start breaking down your plastic mulch. Um, and we haven't got that it worked out quite right yet, uh, where it will either, the, the products that are available tend to 
either start breaking down before you want them to or not break down um, after you've tilled them under because once you've got them under the soil they don't get that light to break them down and the temperatures in the soil don't tend to be high enough to compost them the way a commercial composter would. So some of those products, I would say try if you want to try them, try them on a small part of your field before you invest in them all the way uh, to see how it works under your conditions. Rolled paper mulch um, is another option for people who want to avoid using plastic, but it also tends to be a little bit more fragile. So a little bit into the science of mulches, um, the color is really important to the effect on your, your microclimate. Uh, black is a pretty much the, the industry standard color, um, but white on black is another commonly used one. And when I say white on black, what I mean is you've got that black mulch, and then they've got a white layer on top. Um, because if you just had white mulch, it wouldn't be quite opaque enough. It's really difficult to make a purely white mulch that's opaque enough to keep the light out. Um, so the color of your mulch will affect how much light is reflected, that's number one on the diagram, how much light is absorbed by the mulch itself, and how much is transmitted into the soil underneath. Uh, clear plastic warms the soil the most. Um, some people can use it to warm the soil up early in the season, but it tends to not, not reduce your weed pressure because it makes a nice moist environment a nice moist warm environment uh, with light in it um, so weeds will still germinate and they can still get enough light to grow and start punching through your mulch. Black, as we mentioned, is the industry standard. It tends to provide excellent weed control and it does warm your soil. That black plastic will absorb a lot of sunlight. Uh, aluminized plastic um, that's a sort of shiny plastic, and that would be somewhat similar to the white on black mulch. Um, tends to reflect more solar radiation, and that helps uh, keep your soil temperature from getting too high if you're using it in the middle of the summer in a region where your temperatures get too hot. Um, and there is has been some research on using other types of reflective mulches, uh, that's mostly for pest control. Um, people are trying to use them to repel aphids and reduce disease pressure. So that's a little bit more experimental. There's some research out there on it. And Dave Martin actually knows a lot more about that, that particular research than I do. Um, but I would be happy to follow up with people who are interested in that. So that's all that I've got on mulches. I'm going to move into the row covers and the low tunnels, which it sounds like more of you are interested in from the question that we've got so far. If anyone has questions about mulches in particular, would you put them into the chat pod and um, I'll make sure we get back to them. So floating row covers and low tunnels, that's kind of this um, low tech, low cost version of a high tunnel. That's kind of your, your medium medium tool in between, uh, in between a mulch and a high tunnel. And you can use them on top of mulches as well in combination. Um, they're most commonly made of spun polyester. That's that Rene product that you might have seen. Um, it's kind of, kind of looks like uh, really, really light curtains almost. Um, you could make a low tunnel out of clear plastic as well. That would increase the temperature even more. The reasons we use these are to protect your crops from swings in temperature in those uh, shoulders of the season and also for pest protection, um, particularly in brassica production. People use low tunnels and row covers to protect crops from things like cabbage moth. And you can, you can put them on temporarily when you know the cabbage moth is laying its eggs and then take them off later. The difference between the two in, in education we love we love talking about differences um, between different tools. Uh, row covers, when we talk about row covers, that means that we have something that kind of floats on top of the plants. Um, you just lay it out there like a, like a sheet sometimes, if you've ever done that in your garden. But low tunnels um, are the, that fabric going over small metal hoops like Donita was using. Here's that flo floating row cover. The advantage of this is 
it's quick, it's short term. Um, you can throw it out there if you've got a threat of a frost and you just want to want to give your crops a little bit of protection for 24 hours, 48 hours. Um, but as opposed to a, a low tunnel, there's a greater risk of them blowing away or damaging the foliage if they, you leave them out for too long because you don't have those hoops that you can see in the back of the picture to keep it off the foliage. And usually when people use that, they just weight them down with rocks or in this case, bricks. Low tunnels, which I think is what Donita was talking about. Here's a picture of those with little, little metal hoops and then that spun polyester cloth over the top. And you can see in this example, they've buried the edges very well, uh, which is crucial to keeping it from blowing away. Installing these is more effort than just a floating row cover, but it offers more longer term protection. And you could, instead of using the spun polyester that's in this picture, you could use clear plastic if you wanted to make essentially a miniature greenhouse, really heat up. So that's all I've got on the low tunnels and the floating row covers. We're going to spend the rest of the time on high tunnels. So if anyone has questions about row covers or low tunnels in particular, add them to the chat box, please. So before we get too far into it, comparing high tunnels and greenhouses, a high tunnel, we tend to think about, we tend to define a high tunnel as a relatively low cost temporary structure. Um, so it tends to have flexible plastic covering it. It tends to um, be something that you can you can change up how you use it. You might even be able to move it with some labor, um, certainly more easily than you would uh, a permanent structure like a greenhouse. Traditionally, a high tunnel is hooked up to water, but not electricity. There's a lot of folks, though, Yes, I have been out to the Greener Garden. They do really cool stuff. Um, traditionally, uh, high tunnels are, are hooked up to water, but not electricity. There are certainly people who use sort of a, a hybrid of a high tunnel in a greenhouse, where you might have a, a heater in, in there that you can use um, to turn on on occasion when the temperature drops very low, um, or you might add fans. And that's where you tend to start grading from what we consider a high tunnel into what we consider a greenhouse. Typically, people use passive ventilation where they roll up the sides and then, oh, thank you. There's the, there's that, there's a PDF of the slides that we're working with and also a PDF of some links to where you can learn more information about season extension. Um, some high tunnels are designed with removable ends so you get, can get a small tractor in to till. Um, typically, in a high tunnel, you grow the crops in the soil. A lot of the farmers that I work with in Baltimore are um, actually have, some of them are even growing on blacktop, so then they bring soil in from elsewhere or topsoil or compost and grow in that on the ground um, or on top of a weed barrier. Um, in comparison, in greenhouses, usually you're growing uh, on tabletops. One of the advantages of using a high tunnel is that it gives you another tool for weed control because you're keeping the rain off, you have more control over where where the water is in your high tunnel. Um, so you can use drip tape to be more efficient in your irrigation and get your water right to your crops and that reduces the area in your high tunnel that um, where the soil is moist and an ideal environment for weeds, so that can help you reduce your weed pressure. Um, a lot of folks in high tunnels also use mulches to reduce weed pressure. And another advantage of high tunnels is that you can reduce your disease pressure because you're keeping the crop dry. If, you, if you've ever taken an IPM class, you'll know they talk a lot about how bacteria and oomycetes um, and all those swimming little, little buggies love moisture and that helps them get into the leaves and spread among your crops. So in a high tunnel you have again control over moisture so you can help your crops stay more dry and you can have more control of watering the soil instead of the leaves and that can help reduce your disease pressure. However, again if we go back to that production management, if you then overhead water you're, you're kind of 
um, losing that benefit of a high tunnel. So if you don't have the drip tape, it's important to train the people who are working in your high tunnel to try to bring that, that watering wand in down on the roots instead of overhead watering. Another of the main advantages of high tunnels is that they're very versatile. People use them for many different things, and you can use them for different things at different times of the year. Um, if you have a nursery business, some folks use them as a storage area for plants. Um, if, you're, if you have tables in a high tunnel, one farm I used to work on used them for curing squash and sweet potatoes um, after they harvested them, but before they sold them to people to add that, excuse me, add that sweetness that you need a little bit of time after harvest to add. They provide protection from frosts and cold snaps on the shoulders of the season. And as we talked about on the previous slide, it helps keep your foliage dry and reduces disease pressure. They also facilitate production of high value specialty crops. And this is one of the reasons many people are interested in high tunnels, because they enable you to grow things that you might not be able to grow otherwise, things like cut flowers, um, they tend to be very helpful for cut flower production because they, again, reduce that disease pressure, they reduce the wind and rain damage to your flowers, um, so you can, when, um, when aesthetics are very important to that high value crop, uh, a high tunnel can help with that. Things like ginger and turmeric, I've worked on a farm where they raised those in the summer in high tunnels, actually, in Massachusetts even. Um, a high tunnel in the summer can get up to tropical temperatures, so you can grow tropical crops. Um, the challenge there, though, is it's it's only tropical temperatures in the summer, so that's why people were growing ginger and turmeric, which are annual crops, essentially, um, in our area in a high tunnel instead of something like, say, figs, which you, in Massachusetts, you would need a high tunnel, you would need a greenhouse year-round, but here you can grow outdoors. Uh, raspberries are something people have experimented with growing in high tunnels. Um, Brian Butler has done that. I believe we've got a demonstration at the upper, at the turp farm. Um, baby greens also, we'll talk about that a little bit more and we'll talk about specialty crops in general. And in not to be minimized, a high tunnel is a very pleasant place to do your work uh, in March. There's, there's nothing quite like the feeling of being out in, in early in the spring after you've been cooped up all winter um, in your high tunnel, seeing little bits of snow land on the top and melt uh, while you're in a sheltered space getting stuff started for the season. So let's talk about some tips for constructing a high tunnel. And construction is the stage where it's really important to pay attention and try to avoid causing problems for yourself later on. And one important thing is to watch for drainage problems. In this picture, you can see more the results of drainage issues where water had run through the side of this high tunnel and uh, damaged the strawberries. So slope is really important. Ideally, you would try to build your high tunnel on a flat piece of ground, as flat as possible. But if that's not possible, it's really important to watch for where water drains on your landscapes and make sure you're not building your high tunnel where the water is going to drain through. And the NRCS is a fantastic resource on that. Um, spotting drainage issues is kind of their, their wheelhouse, so I would recommend talking with them about that. Starting the structure of your high tunnel is kind of ideal in August and November, um, because then you're ready to go in the spring. In terms of the cost of starting a high tunnel, um, kits are available for four to five thousand dollars, um, plus shipping and then construction. Um, for, a, for about as small high tunnel, 20 feet by 48 feet, and then it tends to go up from there in terms of kits with all the pieces available. Some folks um, kind of cobble together a high tunnel uh, just piece by piece for lower amounts than that. Um, oh, NRCS, uh, Natural Resources wow. Conservation Service. They're a branch of the USDA. Um, there is an office of the NRCS in every county. Oh, yes. They tend to start at about $4,000 for a kit. So I'll go back to the cost, and then I'll go back to the NRCS. So the kits tend to start at about four to $5,000, um, and you can get them from a couple of different companies. Um, you can also try and cobble something together piece by piece, 
but it's really important to uh, to know what you're doing and, and plan it out because you kind of you get what you pay for. <laughs> I know um, it's it is an investment, um, and and you do you get what you pay for. If you if you try to cut corners too much, there is some cut corner cutting that's available. I do know farmers who who um, made them for less than that amount, uh, but you have to make sure that you're choosing pipe that's strong enough and you're not trying to spread the, the pipes too far out because then they can collapse. The good news though is that the USDA and RCS has funding available through their high tunnel initiative to pay for high tunnels on farms. Um, so they actually, this is a grant, they will reimburse you for costs. Um, I'm not sure what the exact amount is, but it's per square foot. And all the farmers I've talked with have found it to be a really valuable program. So again, back to the NRCS, the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, um, they have an office in every county. And if you're in Baltimore City, the, the Baltimore County office is the one that you would go to. So they are a really valuable resource. They can come out to farms and scout for drainage problems. They have, they have a whole lot of other pro, uh, programs as well with funding for things like grass waterways um, and uh, environmental improvements. But they do also have funding for high tunnels. And you, you can absolutely build a high tunnel with the funding that they have available. Um, the Let's see. The only limitation with this, I believe, is that you, you you have to be willing to jump through some paperwork hoops. But it is honestly the easiest grant you will ever write. Um, you just fill out a form. You don't have to write a whole 10-page thesis for why you deserve this money. You just fill out a form. Um, the first step is to go visit your NRC office and talk with your representative. Um, you do need to get into the Farm Service Agency system um, and get a tracked number that says you are an official farm. Um, some, some FSAs are a little bit more friendly than others, so if you, if you run into trouble, maybe try and talk with your local ag agent and it'll, most people can be, um, they should, they should be willing to work with you. Um, and a lot of the farmers I work with in Baltimore City, because they're so new and we're not used to having farms in cities, um, are not are not part of the farm service agency system, but it's it's worth once you're selling commercially, um, it's worth starting to get into their system because they have a lot of wonderful programs available like this. So if you're in Baltimore City in particular, uh, or in another urban part of the state, and you 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 want to try and um, learn more about getting into the farm service agency system, definitely contact me. Um, and I'd be happy to help with that. If you're in a rural part of the state and you're not in their system for some reason, then try and reach out to them um, or your local ag agent to find out how that would work. So some more tips for construction. The correct structure will ensure a long and productive life for your high tunnel. Here is an example of a high tunnel that, that survived. <laughs> um, you can see the huge amount of snow that they had and it's still standing. That's a testament to the, the work that they put into building it right the first time. Here is an example of a high tunnel that was not so lucky. Um, one was caused by snow damage in the big picture, and one was caused by wind damage in the bottom. So here's where I, I want to caution people against cutting corners. I know um, you might be able to find lower cost pipe, perhaps. You can see in this picture, the pipe they used seems relatively thin. Um, and it, it might seem appealing at the time to try and try and use less expensive pipe, try and spread spread out your ribs, um, but it it's heartbreaking when this happens, and I really don't want this to happen to any of you. So do try and make sure that your 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 build if you're not using a kit, you're designing a high tunnel that will withstand the elements you have to deal with. And um, one of the challenges here in Maryland and also in Delaware, I would imagine, is we're kind of in a transitional climate where um, it's, it gets very warm here. We are technically in the south. We're below the Mason-Dixon line. So we, sometimes we think that we should use high tunnel designs that people use further south. Um, but we also can get 
huge amounts of snow here. We can get uh, three feet of snow in one storm, just like they do further north. Um, so it's important to design your high tunnel to withstand those kinds of elements as well. Uh, question, how do plants get pollinated in a high tunnel? Very good question. Um, so if you have the roll-up sides, um, that we, uh, we'll talk about a little bit more, then your pollinators can get right in and that's not a problem. If you are more in a greenhouse situation where it's fully enclosed, some people then need to bring in pollinators, bring in beehives to pollinate. I think we have a picture of that coming up later. Let me just take a drink of water. All right, so here are, here are the parts of a high tunnel. Um, off on the left, you can see the roll-up bar that rolls up those sides. Um, each, uh, each rib is called a hoop. The purlins connect all the hoops. And then there's this hip board, which is wooden, which um, is very important for the structural integrity and runs along the side. And then a baseboard is also really important um, for holding all the ribs together. And what you can't see is there's a ground post um, for every rib that goes underground. And that's a really important step for making sure your high tunnel does not fly away. One farmer I talked with um, inherited a high tunnel from a previous farm manager. And one day as they were working on it, it was very windy and the sides were rolled up and it just started lifting up off the ground. Um, and they realized that whoever had built it had not put in the pins to connect the, the, hip, the hoops to the ground post, so they just started separating. Um, so the lesson from that, number one, is do install the ground posts. Don't just set your high tunnel on the ground. And number two, make sure you connect your hoops to the ground posts. And don't skimp on ground posts, because it does get really windy here. So there's some numbers here, and you have those in your slides on recommended design specs. Um, if you're not using a, a kit on the, the distance, on sort of the, the, the geometry of a high tunnel. Um, and I, I don't want you to get too overwhelmed by the numbers. Kind of the key concepts are that the wider your high tunnel is, um, the thicker your pipe needs to be to be able to support uh, support that over the width of your high tunnel. And uh, uh, another important thing to consider is not spacing your, your hoops out too far apart. That's another place where people try to cut corners is they think they can have fewer hoops and they'll just stretch them out further. But that's another place where you tend to run into collapses. Um, ah, someone someone's asking whether um, it's costly to move high tunnels that have been abandoned or might be donated to you. It's, you know, it, it requires getting someone with a truck uh, who can get them to you. Uh, it does require some labor, but lots of people do that. Um, lots of people inherit high tunnels from other people and move them and install them on their own land. Um, it's relatively common. It's certainly easier than a permanent building. I don't have any exact numbers for you on how much it would cost, but it's absolutely possible. Um, the, the really key tip I would recommend, though, is make sure you look at um, the diameter of the pipes and make sure that what you're getting is, uh, is going to be strong enough to be worth you making that investment of moving it to your farm. And look for damage as you're, as you're inspecting them before you move it. And maybe you'll need to buy uh, a few parts to replace damaged parts. And you might need to... to fix it up a little bit. It's kind of a fixer up or high tunnel in that case. All right, so when you're setting up your high tunnel, paying attention at the time will save you a lot of heartache in the long run. Um, making sure everything's square and level, any, uh, any deviation from square will increase stress. It looks like we're getting close to one, so I'm going to move along a little faster. I wanted to point out um, this hip board here at the top, you can see the wood with the little tracks on it. This is where you attach your plastic. And this is a really key point in, in design. Most plastic high tunnels, they have one sheet of plastic that goes over the top and attaches in this top track. And then there's a second sheet of plastic that attaches in the bottom track. And that's what you use to roll up the sides. And that's really valuable because then if you get damage to one sheet, you don't have to replace the whole thing. You attach 
the plastic using what we call wiggle wire. Um, and if anyone has used wiggle wire, you know it's uh, painful on your hands. <laughs> um, your thumbs tend to get black and blue, but it's uh, relatively easy. It's like riding a bike. Once you know how to do it, you won't forget it. You just wiggle it into that track and it, it pins your plastic in. And you can even pin multiple layers of plastic that way. Um, I find a, a pair of pliers actually helpful in protecting my thumbs when I'm doing that. Roll-up bars, really crucial. I've, I've worked on high tunnels um, where you tried to roll it up by hand and um, you don't, it, it, gets on, it, get, it stops being fun very quickly. <laughs> um, this is a relatively low-tech roll-up bar. I've visited at the Greener Garden. They have a, a gear-based roll-up bar that makes it really, really easy to roll them up and down. Um, it's, it's passive, it's not electrical, but it's just like um, turning a crank. Straps to hold down the rolled-up sides is important for preventing wind damage. kind of holds everything together. Um, here we've got a place where a roll-up bar eventually was damaged by stress. You might need to end up replacing it. You can see there's kind of a curve there on the side. Um, and this is also a good example of someone using a heater in a high tunnel. And if you are using a heater, something really important to remember is that you're going to need to vent that heater outside so you don't um, you don't asphyxiate your your plants because plants love CO2 but they only love it so much. Um, here's a picture of building a high tunnel. You can see these folks are building are bringing in topsoil and then laying down mulch. And here's the result in the end. They've planted and staked tomatoes in that mulch. And another key thing to point out is a lot of folks will put down netting underneath that that side layer of plastic um, that and that can be used to keep pests out but it will also keep pollinators out um, so that's something you need to think about maybe maybe you would put that netting down to keep the pests out after your crops have flowered all right high tunnel management High level of management can lead to a highly productive tunnel. Uh, you can you grow multiple crops, but the opposite is also true. If you if you don't manage your tunnel successfully, um, you can just make a beautiful place to grow weeds. Temperature management is really really crucial. Um, and, uh, in the summer, a high tunnel with the sides rolled down can easily reach 120 degrees Fahrenheit and can cook your crops. Even in the winter, a high tunnel in on a sunny day, even if it's 30 degrees outside can reach 90 degrees inside, and that's plenty to cause heat stress in your cool season crops like lettuces. Uh, however, there's huge cropping potential if you manage your high tunnel properly. Lettuces are a great specialty crop to grow in high tunnels. They're probably the most common. Um, they allow you to produce lettuces early, and they keep them clean. They, um, that reduction in rainfall um, reduces that splash that gets soil into your into your uh, mix and it can also reduce that bitter flavor from getting too much sun and it makes it very easy to cut them. Uh, raspberries, as we mentioned, are something people grow in high tunnels and in that handout there's some information, a link to more information about growing raspberries in high tunnels. Strawberries are another common one. Strawberries tend to be a good fit for low or high tunnels um, because it enables you to extend the season and protect the fruit from predators, pests, and diseases. Strawberries tend to get a lot of diseases. And there are many creative ways to grow strawberries in high tunnels to use your space, space efficiently. One of the problems people tend to run into, though, is if you're using these um, sort of gutters, if you're not in there every day checking the water level, um, they can dry out very quickly. Cucumbers. Um, lots of folks grow cucumbers in high tunnels because they tend to be a little bit thinner skinned and sweeter when they're protected from the elements like that. And you can easily hang netting to great, grow them vertically and be an efficient use of space. This is a good time to mention that your high tunnel is kind of your, your highest value piece of acreage on your farm. So it's really important to grow something in there that you can't grow outdoors to make the best use of the investment that you've made. Um, beyond basic high tunnels, you can have low tunnels inside your high tunnels to increase the temperature even more. If anyone's read um, Elliot Coleman's books, that's one of the things he uses. You can also add heat sinks, like big um, rain barrels, to gather heat 
in the hot part of the day and then release it gradually over the night. You can try active heating. Some people do that. Um, uh, add a heater or even a portable heater inside your high tunnel for those cold snaps. Um, I'd really like to emphasize, though, to be careful of fire risk. I, I know one farmer who had a high tunnel burned down because they had some, uh, some cardboard boxes that were too close to their heater. And I really don't want that to happen to any of you. That's, so you, if you're going to use a temporary heater, make sure you place it carefully and exhaust it properly. If you're using drip tape, that it enables you to try using fertigation. Here's an example of a fertigation setup. Um, some people, if you're if you love electronics, have figured out how to automate your roll-up sides based on here. We got a little temperature sensor. Um, I don't know of any off-the-shelf automated roll-up side kits, but I'm sure those will be coming around. Um, but if if this is your hobby, you could probably develop something. Um, here's an example of some, someone asked about pollination. This is a completely enclosed high tunnel, um, a little bit more like a greenhouse, honestly. You can see those uh, powered exhaust vents on the end and the heater um, where they're raising, uh, raising tomatoes. And you can see they had to bring in pollinators to pollinate those tomatoes. You can, of course, pollinate by hand. Some people do that. Uh, it's a lot of labor, though. Mobile high tunnels. This is uh, Brian Butler's research. Well, this picture is not. This is a failed high tunnel that someone tried to make um, sort of by cobbling things together. Um, mm -hmm. But Brian developed down at Turp Farm this experimental mobile tunnel for his raspberry research that enabled a rotation with the high tunnel where you could have your land covered part of the year, but not the rest of the year. And that's a really important thing to mention is one of the challenges you run into with high tunnels is because you don't have the rain leaching through your soil all the way because you, you tend to just be watering artificially, um, you can end up having salt accumulation that can reach such high salinity levels that it will actually impede germination of your small crops. So if you have a mobile tunnel, that's one way to get around it. You let the rain in occasionally. Uh, another way is you do have to replace the plastic every three to five years. So whenever you do that, it helps to uh, leave the plastic off for a year and let the water, let the rain leach those salts out of the soil. If you're on city water, um, a lot of city water is a higher pH actually than rainwater. So you can end up with increasing pH um, up into the eights. Uh, so that's some folks who, who do that then need to acidify their soil. I'm going to skip this slide. Um, so here are some links where you can go to learn more about season extension. The University of Maryland Extension has some great uh, publications on using high tunnels uh, in general. This first one compared is a case study of I think three or four farmers that used high tunnels and their economics. Um, there's also a lot of information about using high tunnels to produce raspberries. Penn State is a national leader in high tunnel research. They have manuals available. Uh, University of Minnesota has some information about using low tunnels for strawberry production, but our climate is very different here, um, so that's some of that information might not be appropriate. And there's a link to the USDA's High Tunnel Initiative, and all of those are available in the PDF down at the right. So we have, I think, four minutes left for questions. Sorry, I went on a little bit. Um, are there any other questions that people have before we before we end this session?